Hello, I'm Leroy Garcia, and this is Blue Rain Gallery Podcast. Today we are back in the home studio of artist extraordinaire Jim Vogel. Uh, welcome to your own studio. <laughs> Thank you, Leroy. <laughs> welcome back. <laughs> it's nice. It's so beautiful out here. You did such a great job on the studio. Um, I want to start this uh, by referencing uh, one of the first podcasts we did was with uh, Jim Bogle. And uh, you can go to our website, blueraingallery.com, and, and listen to that. Uh, it's, it's an hour long, but there's a lot of information on there if you really want to get to know Jim Bogle more. So it's episode number five uh, on the list. Um, today, what I wanted to talk with Jim about was his upcoming show, which is really interesting. It doesn't have necessarily a theme, but it is called Happenstance. Um, tell us a little bit about Happenstance, uh, the direction of this show. Okay, so um, Kristen came up with the word Happenstance, trying to describe the body of work as it was coming together. And she's kind of like, it's just Happenstance. It comes into your head and it comes out. And so that clicked as, as a way to encapsulate like this body of work for this year. And uh, to me, it's, it's a reference also to when people say the Lord works in mysterious ways or um, attribute something to it's just a coincidence is happenstance is that too. But it made me wonder, are there ways to manipulate happenstance? And so one of the pieces that I wanted to bring into the show was the Bureau of Happenstance. And we'll talk about that a little later. But um, I know people are used to, a lot of the Blue Rain collectors are used to me having a thematic show. Um, Dr. Locio, Flamenco, but this time I needed a break from that. So whatever happened to come into my head, it came out on the canvas. Nice, nice. Well, let's get right into it. I, um, there's a huge panel piece that was delivered to the gallery the other day. And uh, we will be posting these pictures uh, as we talk about them. Um, but the first one that I wanted to talk about was uh, I glimpsed the devil dancing. And can you describe that scene? Yeah, so what it is, um, it's kind of a old-time plaza dance scene. If you picture like the Santa Fe Plaza or even like the smaller plaza here in Dixon where um, the people would just look for a reason to have a party, a fiesta, and, and decorate, clean out the area, and have a dance with a live band. And um, The idea of the way it's framed came from this antique window frame, and it it's, looks like it would have been out of a storefront in Santa Fe. The, got pulled out to be replaced with something more efficient. And so I thought of like glimpsing out this window towards the happening out in the plaza. And there's 20 plus figures in there. I think if you count the cat and the dog, there might be like 23. Um, so it's just a real lively, there's all these figures dancing and intermingling and um, a lot of direction based on the structure of the of the window frame. So there's 32, one, I thought two, three, it was 30, four, but 30 mullions, yeah. individual squares in the window. So I had to compose the painting so that it worked as one unit, but also so that the structure of the window could help define a detail. So is it one painting or is it a bunch of panels that you painted individually? N no, it's not one. It is one painting. Because if I tried to do individual panels, that would have driven me crazy. Yeah, yeah. I could so that. I worked out the grid on the canvas so I knew where, at least before I painted on it, I knew where the, uh, the structure of the window would lay. Mm -hmm. And so I was able to paint it as one unit. So it looks almost, uh, again, more like a, uh, a Depression era dancing scene, the way people are dressed in this. Yeah. Right, it, um, which is cool. Uh, one thing I didn't talk about in the last uh, podcast was uh, a semi influence from um, Thomas Hart Penn. Who who were your who were the people that influenced you the most? Um, growing up in Roswell, I had an overload of seeing Peter Hurd mm -hmm. and Henrietta Wyeth, mm -hmm. and she was his actually Henrietta Wyeth Hurd, but and Louis Jimenez and. 
they were on top of some other secondary artists. Um, I could see them all the time because of the Rawls Art Museum. And it was that regionalist feel that spoke to my heart. And that's the way I saw things and I still see things. And so I connected with that. And then as I got out of my little world in, in Southern New Mexico, I realized that there were other painters that painted like that. Thomas Hart Benton, as you mentioned, um, the, the American regionalists, uh, Grant Wood, Stuart Curry, and it just made me realize that there were other people that saw the world that way yeah. and painted the world that way. Well, this piece really captures a lot of that, that era and style. It's beautiful. Well, thank you. It's probably one of the largest pieces you've done. It's a 68 by 78. Yeah, it is. It's, it's probably the biggest canvas panel I've done. You've done a long piece before. Right. Like the night scene, About, right? Yeah, six feet. Or that was eight feet wide. Eight feet. But it, it wasn't the, the full scale of that. Um, it was tough because I usually do a full-size drawing of everything I paint, and I draw it to scale, but I didn't have a drawing wall that big. So I did a half-scale drawing and then had to transfer that onto the canvas. And then just literally manipulating the canvas on my easel and rolling it around and, and having to support it on the back so that it wouldn't flop around. And that, that was a little more challenging than I had anticipated when I would come in and early in the morning and I'd open this garage door to get fresh air in here. And I did that one morning and went back home and made coffee and I came back out and the, the canvas was leaning against my painting table instead of being on the easel because it was big enough. It was like a, a sail. And it was early enough on that I didn't do any damage, but it, it reminded me, I can't leave those doors open anymore. <laughs> yeah, the wind, the wind can get there pretty good. All right, let's uh, talk about this next one, because this is a pretty good one, too. Um, fire Exit. Yeah, so Fire Exit, it's relatively small, and um, I don't know for those of you out there that haven't noticed, but New Mexico was on fire earlier this summer. Uh, half of the state. Yeah, and so that influenced me. And the, the piece is a circle, and the composition is all built around this pinyon tree that has burst in the flame, and it's resident animals um, leaving. And there's, a, there's like a cooper's hawk and a rattlesnake and a jackrabbit. And for me, it, it's not a destruction idea. It's not a sad idea. It, it's kind of a renewal and kind of picture the phoenix. There's a sense that the tree is the phoenix, and from that damage will come new life. Um, and another inspiration for this one and the other fire painting comes from you and Doug West. Uh -oh. Because on that podcast, it, I was listening in the studio, and I was doing drawings, and um, I remember, I think Doug was in Mexico. Yeah, you, you, that was a hard doing remote. Do. Yeah, And he said something like, oh, in this one, it, the clouds... They look like it's a fire, but it's not. It's not. I don't want you to think I painted the fire. And I was drawing these, and I'm like, jeez, man, I'm, I'm drawing the fire right now. It's pretty cool. <laughs> and it just made me realize, like, the different perspective, mm -hmm. that he saw this idea of the fire being detrimental. And it is. Well, he's known for those um, classic or the really landscape-y part right. of New Mexico. The, no you know, human intrusion. Correct, correct. Yeah. It's pristine. Yeah, so that, um, and then the, the capper for this piece is the frame that Kristen put together is, it's a, a wheel for a, a farm implement, and it has all these pointy teeth on it, and we immediately thought of, you know, like, oh, burning ring of fire, and uh, so she leafed it in this variegated copper leaf that looks like swirling flames when it's all done. And it, it was just one of those pieces that just popped together really well. Yeah, no, it's, it's beautiful. Uh, it's probably a heavy piece, too. It weighs a lot for its <laughs> size. And I, I, love, I love this show because there's a lot a mixture of uh, you and, and your wife, Kristen, in here. Um, so the next one is called Time to Go. Yeah. Tell us about that one. That one is, it is a sad take on the fire. And... Uh, when it was at its peak and some of our friends in the Penasco area, they didn't know if they were going to have to leave or not. And it was just a gauge. 
you know, it's, I guess, today, the day we go and we have... Uh, well, they're put on notice. And, yeah. And skills. Ready, set, go. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, an, an older couple friend of ours did get told to leave. And even though that they weren't at risk at the moment, as soon as they left their property, they wouldn't be able to go back. And it, it was just alarming. You know, it's like, do we have all the medication we were supposed to take every day because we can't come back for that? Um, and then that week I was in Walmart and there was this old timer in there and we were both in the men's clothing aisle. That's where I shop for my clothes. No, just kidding. But he, he's looking at stuff and he's like, it's all so expensive. He goes, I have to buy everything because I'm from Mora and I don't have anything. He says, I left with the clothes on my back and he was literally having to buy clothes to be able to change clothes. And that was really sad. And at the time I, you know, thought of this idea of like the consequences of a family having to decide when is it time to go? And we had acquired an antique mantle clock, which then became the, the home for this painting. And Kristen let her pyrotechnic step in and set it on fire. <laughs> um, nice. And then on the piece, this is like the string for me is the husband is holding the wife. The wife is holding the baby. The baby is holding the teddy bear and the teddy bear is holding on by a thread. I see. Well, for those of you who don't know, um, that fire in Mora spread really, really fast. And so a lot of people left in that condition and it, it was sad. And I, uh, I think a lot of us, um, said a lot of prayers and, and donated a lot of money and things to help in the recovery. Uh, yeah. Because they, a lot of those people were poor anyways. You know, right. they, they live off the land and then it's just gone. And uh, if you've been in an arid climate with uh, fire, uh, the, those trees and bushes explode really fast and rapidly. Yeah, there's so, so little uh, moisture content Yeah, just, that it's just dry fuel. Oh, yeah. So that's a very impactful uh, painting. And then we go to She Let Me Go. This one's very personal in the sense that although it's not a portrait of my mom it is my mom and the young hispanic woman in that is is actually based on her face and her smile and that was at one time difficult for me to paint um because both my parents have passed um but i also felt good about it because at that age in all the pictures, I didn't know her then. Of course, <laughs> I know. <laughs> That's when she only had two kids. <laughs> well, I was listening to the podcast, the first podcast coming down today, and uh, you talking about your mom and dad and how they met and all yeah. that. So that's funny. And so, like, it's at in my mind, it's at a point in her life where she was optimistic about being a mother, and the excitement of it, and the idea of needing to let every one of us go at a certain point. So as a parent, we learn this is um, we love our children. We want to keep them close. But for them to be wholly who they can be, we have to let them go. And I appreciate the fact that she let me go. And It's hard for a parent, for sure. Yeah. And one of the, the details on it, the, the structure of the frame is an antique um, shutter window. It's clad in copper or brass. It's very beautiful. And it has this embossed grid pattern that mimicked this piece of wallpaper that I had pulled out of my son's house. So I've been helping our middle son, Sage, remodel an old house on the plaza in Dixon. Old, old, like original construction was actually 1700s, and some of that's still there. And when we pulled down some paneling that had been put up in the 70s, there was this old wallpaper that was on the adobe wall had been the kitchen so it has this really beautiful kitchen motif and it just spoke to me of like again that optimism of that time and there was a big enough piece of this canvas wallpaper that i was able to pull it off the wall save it and then laminate it onto the panel to paint on so you painted on the wallpaper yeah so that's right on the wallpaper wow. it's it's been laminated with uh, an acrylic gel medium to protect it Wow, that's amazing. Yeah, it, uh, that's a great story, uh, Jim. It's, it, that's kind of what I thought when you I just read the title and saw the bird. Uh -huh. <laughs> I had three little birds I had to let go. Too, yeah, 
kind of the same as you. Mm -hmm. All right, and then uh, the next piece over here, icing on the cake, and that's an unusual piece. Yeah, that one is really fun. Again, it's, it's based on happenstance. So one of my sisters was visiting, Kristen and I, on the weekend, and we said, well, let's take the high road to go home, or take her back to Santa Fe to catch the train to Albuquerque. And uh, so we drove up through Penasco and uh, Ojo Circle and Las Trompas. And Las Trompas has a really amazing church. And they had scaffolding up over one of the, the bell towers. And at first it's like, oh, you know, that's disappointing because you don't get to get that full experience of seeing the front facade of the church. But then it made me realize it's like, no, it's great because they're, they're going to re-mud, re-plaster it. And uh, so then that just stuck in my head. And Kristen had already been working on this frame, which was very ornate. And um, it came off an another clock. And she actually did the finish work before I even thought of a painting to put in it. And it looked like a cake, like a wedding cake. Kind it of does look me. like a cake. Yeah. <laughs> and then I started thinking about, well, when they're plastering this church, they're putting the icing on the cake, you know, that last finished it coat fits. of mud. Yep. And, uh, and so then I, I knew exactly what I was going to put in there and it fit the format perfectly, that very vertical look. Um, and then another funny detail is then Kristen shared it on her um, Facebook or something. Mm -hmm. And a friend of ours, Margaret Campos, she looked at it and she goes, yeah, how come there's no women in there? And I, she's like, traditionally uh, in Haradoras, the mudders were the women. The men mixed the mud. The women applied it because right. they have that nice touch. Mm -hmm. And I said, tell her to look real close to the figure on the, on the top. <laughs> and then, you know, she responds, says, oh, yeah, I see her braids hanging down and her tiny little boobies under her overalls. <laughs> That's funny. You know, uh, something that you may not know is that um, when I was interviewing uh, Victor Gustavo Guler, and um, he's, for those of you who don't know, he's a Santero, and, uh, but he's also a, uh, one of the top restorers of devotional artwork, uh, probably in our country and maybe uh -huh. in this half of the hemisphere. Um, but he's actually doing restoration work in the La Trampas, work, at that chapel. Yep. And in that chapel is worked by my, my great great yeah. grandfather. Mm -hmm. I yeah. didn't know if I had remembered Bern that part of it or Mi that. Mirai Pacheco. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's a great, um, great screen in there. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. Uh, he, I need to see that when, I, uh, when he finishes the restoration on it. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting because he said that. Uh, there was another guy. He knows all the, the history of everybody. Because some guy painted over the screen, so uh -huh. he's having to go back and restore it. And uh, his knowledge is, is that good that he can go back and replicate everything that was done. That's amazing. But yeah. So that, there's a lot of history in, in New Mexico. Um, let's take a break for a second. Okay, we're back. Um, we have uh, a piece on the table that's a very unique piece, and, and this just shows the creativity behind... Uh, Jim and Kristen, uh, and how they see things and uh, utilize found objects. Uh, most of them are historical in nature, as far as they're pretty old. Um, in front of us, we have a piece titled Bureau of Happenstance. Maybe it's the namesake, in a way, <laughs> for the show. Um, but tell us a little bit about this piece, Jim. Okay, so it is the namesake. Leroy, you're correct in that. And we've had this little box with six drawers in it for quite a while, trying to figure out what to do with it. And it was a, a medical hardware, our medical plaster for casts um, supply cabinet. And after we'd settled on the title Happenstance for the show, I thought of this kind of silly title, the Bureau of Happenstance. And initially it was like, you know, the FBH, the Federal Bureau of Happenstance, like they would investigate happenstances. Um, but the other meaning for Bureau, of course, is like a chest of drawers. And this was this little miniature chest of drawers, and Kristen dressed it up to give it a little more of that presence. And so within the six drawers, what I thought I would do is you could pull out any random drawer and see what the situation would contribute to your happenstance. And for instance, on this drawer that we've pulled out, I haven't assembled it yet, but it'll have a little painting in it that is either dry or wet. 
and that could contribute to the situation. And then the way this also works, I'm going to set this down, is the drawers, their original little pulls are these little rings. And then you could, you know, like if you have this in your home on the mantle or whatever, you have a hook next to it and you can randomly pick which drawer you could hang on the wall next to it. Or if you want, you can pull them all out or let them, you know, like kind of hang open a little bit and look inside. So I can't see the front. How many, how many drawers are there? There are six drawers. So there'll be six paintings. There'll be six paintings some of them because the drawers are divided right which you can see like this like one is a quarter panel. so it might be a painting that has four panels wow. for our four, four images. sections mm -hmm. and they're they're pretty random mm -hmm. but they have a consistent theme that um i i painted them yeah <laughs> <laughs> that makes them consistent i think it's wonderful and, and you can uh take out a drawer when whatever whatever you're inspired by for the day yeah you know, pretty cool concept <laughs> by happenstance by happenstance yeah nice um so the next painting and the final one we want to talk about is francis with momento amori yes right mori amori not amori amori that's not love. amori that's love mori which is the mortality part yeah right yes um so this one is my take on a classic uh, favorite Catholic saint image of St. Francis. Um, we've all seen him, whether we're Catholic or not. We've seen the, the skinny Italian guy with the brown robe and the rope around his waist with birds flying around him and um, various other attributes. And what I did is I wanted to take him and pull him into my world and not really focus on representing him as a robed saint, but as a homeless person, because he was, historically he did make a conscious decision to give up his wealth and, and position and w roamed the hills of Italy, basically, um, and forsake material goods. And um, he was reported to have suffered from the stigmata, which is the wounds of Christ, the holes in his palms and his feet, and a gash in his side spontaneously like erupting and that's represented very subtly in the image and what I did is I placed him in kind of you know like a canyon right out my window and made it very New Mexican appearing and also held on to some some of his attributes um, and one of them is the the memento mori which is Latin for remember we all shall die and Francis was very comfortable with the concept of death. In fact, he would re reference it as brother death. Like, I, wor I walk with my brother death every day. And it's not a morbid concept. It's not like dwelling on death. It's actually reminding us to get the most out of our life. Like, every day is precious because tomorrow you may not have. And that is a very common attribute in a, many of his portraits. He has a skull either. He's holding it. Um, or it's on the ground next to him. One of the other mythological stories about him is that he was asked by this village of Gubbio in Italy. They had this problem with the local wolf that was literally eating their children and their old people and their livestock. And they knew the rumor of Francis being uh, good with animals. So they asked him to go speak to the wolf. And he went to the wolf and worked out a deal. And the wolf was basically saying, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a carnivore. I need to eat. And so he said, well, if the village feeds you, will you lay off the children and the old people and the animals? And he's like, you got a deal. So then Francis goes back and says, you know, you feed the wolf, he'll leave you alone. And so that's why I put the, the wolf at, the, at his feet, kind of, as a friend. kind of glancing up at him. And also it's a re, it is a visual representation of... Um, you may notice uh, a lot of homeless people also have their animal companion, and that's part of that story too. And one of the other things is I, and this is subtle. Like these are all little things I do for myself, and I have to tell the collectors or you about it so that you know why I did that. Right. But he's wearing like olive drab, old issue army jeans or pants. Well, what's not really known a lot about Francis was historically. 
he was from a very wealthy family. As a young man, he trained to be like a knight or a soldier mercenary, and he did fight in the war, and he was on the losing side, and he was actually a POW for a while. And so he came out, he was a veteran. And as we know, a lot of our homeless people veterans. are veterans, mm -hmm. and that's a small attribute in my piece to reference that. And um, the structure of the, the piece, it's, it's in an old, an antique uh, Gothic door frame. And on the top of it is a large arch that has bars in the windows. And I have three nightingales flying against the bars or holding onto the bars. And again, it, it references Francis's relationship with the birds. The nightingales, you know, reported to be the most beautiful song um, in Italy, like the best songbird in Italy. And then the final one that um, I'll point out is that I put a yucca in there which is, of course, one of our native beautiful flowers. And another little known fact, or maybe everybody knows this, and I was the only one that did I had no idea until you yeah. told me. That the yucca is in the lily family. And the lily, we're all familiar with it being used as a flower to commemorate a death, like at a funeral or something. It's also, you know, unofficially the flower for St. Francis. And, and so that was just another one of those things where the, it dovetailed. And the New Mexico and the Assisi story kind of dovetailed for me. And I feel like it's, like, who am I to judge? I'm the one that made it, and along with Kristen, we're going to frame. But I feel like it's one of my masterpieces. It, it, it is. It has a lot to do. You forgot to tell us about his belt. Oh, right. So his, his pants are held up with a rope belt, and one of... The attributes of Franciscan priests actually have them to this day is their their belt is a, a knotted rope. And so I put that in there, which is also a very common way to hold your pants up if you don't have a belt. Mm -hmm. um, the other, it's a very subtle detail, but it's actually the most important part of the painting for me because as I was working on it and I finished his eye, it all snapped together. And it's a really small part of the painting, but another attribute of Francis was that he was actually going blind into the last years of his life. And so I um, wanted to make sure I represented that. But when I finished the eye, it, it just kind of came to life for me. And, and it was a really strong visual representation of, of that. And it looks like at first glance, and you'll see it in the drawing and in the finished painting, he might be like scare, staring up at the, the skull, the memento mori, but what I see is that he's looking past it up into the archway at the nightingale, mm -hmm. and that's kind of like his spirit, and that's like the afterlife is up there, and he's looking past death into his, his afterlife. And then on the, I noticed also on the top of the piece is a, a skull. Oh, that's right. So we finished it off. Um, <laughs> with our own little memento mori, and it's uh, a turkey vulture skull, which, again, the turkey vulture, a carrion bird, and is also in other traditions where the vultures are the carriers of our remains to heaven. You know, like you let the turkey vulture eat you, and then he takes you up to heaven. <laughs> so... Those of you out there that are worried about it, it is not a biological turkey vulture skull. It's actually a super great replica. But I dare you to figure out that it's not real because it's, it's beautiful. And Kristen finished it on a nice plate that locks into the frame. Yeah, it looks nice. Oh, I think that's fantastic. Um, this has turned out to be a great show. I like it, even though it's a kind of a multi -years, uh, multiverse of themes. Uh -huh. uh, but it's beautiful. I like that. Thank you, Leroy. I like the space you gave yourself to do that. Thank you. I'd um, like to thank Jim for letting us come in. Oh, there's the one studio. more thing. Oh, what's that? In the show, I will also have the smallest painting oh. I have ever painted. And you won't see it on the website. You won't see it in this podcast. You have to come to Blue Rank Gallery to see it. Do you want to tell us a little bit about the dimension of it? or It's, it's about this big. It's, oh, yeah. Okay, we're on a podcast. Look, it's this big. It is 
less than two inches square. Yeah. It's a cool piece. <laughs> like that. Well, I'd like to thank Jim for allowing us into his studio today. Thank you for coming, Leroy. Yeah, I think that's a good idea to educate people on what you're doing, how you how you conceive things, and what goes behind the work. Um, I'd like to encourage everybody to uh, subscribe to our podcast on any of the platforms, but you can always find us on blueraingallery.com under podcast. I'd like to also encourage everybody to visit our print shop blueraingprintshop.com bringing art into your everyday life thanks <laughs> thank you now that's a lot of editing she's in there <laughs> <laughs> that was funny thank you guys <laughs> <laughs>